Uh, we're going to finish uh, Mark chapter 8 today. It's a fantastic thing. But I tell you what, right now, with what's happening... Huh? Oh, Matthew. Same thing. Starts with M. Um, it's, at the, it's, it's, it's at the start of the New Testament. That's all right. Um, but I tell you what, for, th- for 30 years... Ezekiel 38, 39 has been my favourite prophecy and I am so tempted to annoy Matthew again and maybe visit it maybe next week because there's a lot going on in there that people have got the wrong, um, you got the wrong handle. Putin is the baddie. You wouldn't want to be ruled by Zelensky any day of the week. You'd take a thousand McGowans before you'd have one Zelensky, all right? So it's not as clear, hand, uh, as clear cut as you imagine. But one of the things that has always fascinated... <laughs> That's Eric's sense of humour. So. <laughs> um, but there's always been one, one little phrase in that prophecy that has never been answered before. And it's always irritated me. And that is the one where God says, I will put a hook in his jaw and turn him around, which gives you the impression that he was going in the opposite direction. Do you understand? And no one, all of the commentators I've ever listened to for 30 years, has never been able to clearly explain that. And even I couldn't see it. What? But he's coming down. Why would he... Be? And so Ukraine has just given me probably the answer to it. You know what I mean? And, and I think you can build uh, an answer to that. So um, if, if I'm not killed by fire and brimstone this week, we might have a quick look at it next week if, uh, if, um, if uh, Matthew has a go at me. But someone who is a member of this church has just handed me something, and I'm just gobsmacked. And I don't know if... Any of you have seen this before or have been given one? It's called a National Church Life Survey. Okay? And it's got 69 questions in it. And it's been handed out at churches throughout Perth. I don't care if you're vaxxed or unvaxxed. I don't care what race, ethnicity, um, uh, tradition within Christianity you are. I only care if you love Jesus and you want to go up there as soon as possible. That's the only thing. You're either lost or you're saved. That's the only division in humanity. But there was a couple of questions in here that really upset this person. And first of all, um, they ask your ethnic origin, who you are racially. What's that got to do with anyone? What do you do? Have you got a different Christianity if you're Ethiopian or Aboriginal or Indian? That's bad enough. Where, was you, where were you born? Where was your mother born? Where was your father born? I'd say none of your business. <laughs> but here's one of the things that really bothered me. In the past 12 months, have you done any of the following? Lent or gave money to someone outside your family? What's that got to do with anyone? We just helped our son out this week because he's struggling, because he won't do it, and so he's on reduced income. That's got nothing to do with anyone else. But here's the kicker. Have you attended a public meeting or a march? Seriously? Seriously? That was put out by the Chinese Communist Party, so they know who to go when they invade Australia, probably. That is just disgraceful. Utterly disgraceful. I mean, even if you answered the questions, what are they going to do with the information? That is disturbing. Very disturbing. I'm worked up before I even start preaching. (laughs) So what we've done in Matthew 8, Matthew 8, and it's coming up, this is called Victory Over Darkness. 
because the biggest thing in this passage is the two demoniacs uh, over in Gadara. Uh, but just to quickly um, um, refresh, Jesus has already cured a leper, which was staggering. It's also one of the three messi messianic miracles. He actually went and offered to come into a centurion's home and heal his servant. And that's amazing because you were declared ritually unclean as a Jew if you went into the home of a Gentile. And, you know, it's absolutely fascinating. I can say this quite confidently even, if, even over um, uh, Facebook. We have lots and lots and lots of Jewish friends. And we have been working with the Jewish community now since 1997 here in Perth. And uh, Sue uh, put on a birthday party for her, her um, friend this week. And some Jewish people came. Um, and uh, they're good friends of ours. And they said, um, you and Stuart must come over home and we'll have coffee, all right? That's fine. And we get all of these invitations. Do you see what I mean? The funny thing is, they won't come to a Gentile house, even if you're very good friends with them. It's ingrained in them. And it's that Jewishness that I'm trying to get into you and understand when we're doing the Matthew thing. So for Jesus to say in front of the great multitudes that were surrounding him, I will come to your house and I will heal him, that, would have, that was like heart shock to them. You're claiming to be the Messiah and you're going to go not only into a Gentile's house but into a Roman army officer's house? You've got to be kidding me. And, and now the third one was uh, he, he came into Peter's house and that's where we start today on verse 14. And there were, there were three groups that were um, uh, instrumental in teaching the people and the disciples what Jesus was all about because in the Sermon on the Mount 5, 6 and 7 he pointed out the hypocrisy of the, na of, of the national religious leadership of the day that gave great um, um, uh, public displays of religiosity but their hearts were far from God. And that's always something that we need to be challenging yourself about. I mean, if we, we can say the right things, we can quote the right verses, we can smile at the right people at the right time, but what's going on here? What's going on here? And I tell you what, it's a tough time at the moment. And this time that we're living in, that you and I have been born specifically for, like Esther, this is really showing God, not that he doesn't already know, and us, whether we're churchians or we're Christians. A churchian is someone who attends a, cer a ceremony on a Sunday and thinks that's going to get them into heaven. A Christian is someone who knows that they're a blood-bought child of the living God. And, it's, and, and the people who have drifted away and the people who have come in at this time really shows everyone where everyone's faith is really uh, placed and, and that is an amazing thing. And this is all, this is everything that is going through uh, in Matthew chapter 8. So in verse 14, we now look at this one. Now, when Jesus had come into Peter's house, that's after the uh, centurion's uh, servant was healed, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her with his hand. Now, people were watching him heal the leper. And what did he do with the leper? He touched him. And he, the same hand touched Peter's mother-in-law. Do you see what I mean? There's no medical protocol as far as Jesus is concerned. If you're sick, he's going to save you. And so he touched her with his hand and the fever left her and she arose and served them. Give me a break. I often read commentaries. I always read the commentaries after I've done my message because I don't want someone influencing me, right? I read them afterwards. And one of them said that the, Peter's mother arose with a broad grin of appreciation on her face. And I got the Bible and I went, <laughs> it doesn't say that. If she's got a house full of guests and she's just been crook with, with a fever 
and Jesus has just healed us, and then she's got to go up and serve them tea and biscuits. Do you know what I mean? It's, I mean, it's just, and she woke up with a, she got up with a great smile of appreciation on her face. This is why you've got to be very careful. That's an extreme version. But you have to be very careful of what you read in commentaries because it will lead you astray of these things. And Luke's version, just as an example, records that those in the house beseeched Jesus to heal her and rebuked the fever, and, it, and he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And this is exactly what went on with the centurion. In Matthew's version, and Matthew's a Jew, and he's only interested in the simple facts of the matter. And with the centurion surgeon, uh, a servant, uh, in the Matthew thing is the centurion came to Jesus. But in the Luke version, the centurion sent emissaries, Jewish emissaries, on his behalf. It doesn't matter. The same thing was the outcome that the servant was healed. And Luke's a Gentile, and he will think the way that you and I think. If we were watching there 2,000 years ago in Kephanahum and looking at this thing, we would have written like Luke. But a Jewish person doesn't look at the minutiae of everything that's going on. He just says, what was the problem and what was the solution? That's the way they think. And we have known them for so long now. I'm amazed at the way they think. They have a conceptual ability that you and I don't have. You and I have a mathematical appreciation of life. Jewish people have a conceptual, a conceptual view of life. And that's why the Greek of the New Testament, the Koine Greek of the New Testament, is the most militarily, scientifically precise language that's ever been devised. Hebrew is the most conceptual language that's ever been devised. And if you're as old as me, you'll remember quite some time ago that NASA sent a, uh, uh, an object into space and just sent it on the farthest trajectory that they... It's probably still going if it hasn't been hit by a, a heavenly ob object. But they had pictures of hum human beings, pictures of the planet pictures of what we do for sports, things that we do for work, and all the rest of it. But what was the language they described all of those things in? Hebrew. Hebrew, because the, the actual letters of the language are explanatory of what the words mean. And they're thinking that if there is some intelligent people out there that see that, they might understand. It was a waste of money because there is no intelligent life out there. And people say, I've so annoyed people over the years by saying that. They say, well, how do you know that the universe is gigantic? How do you know there's not intelligent people out there? And I say, well, are they saved or are they lost? If they're saved and they were never sinners, how did we get the pineapple? And he says, if they're lost and they are sinners, how do they get saved? Because Jesus died once for all on this planet. This is the center of the universe, and this is the center of the divine romance that gets you and I into heaven forever with our heavenly Father. It only happens here. And you say, oh, you can't say that because we haven't searched all of the universe. I don't need to. Jesus died once for all on a cross, on a hill, outside Jerusalem, 2,000 years ago. That's it. And people go, oh. People come up after, will come up to me afterwards and say, but I have, I've heard someone say something you know, about that. Listen, I read the Bible. This is the divine romance. And, let me, and I tell people who, who struggle with that, and I tell them, if Satan had another opportunity, he'd pick up his ball and go there, wouldn't he? Why is he obsessed with you and I and this planet? Because it's the only one. And we don't have a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation 21. We do have those in 21 and 22. We don't have a new heaven and new earths all around the universe. There's only one new heaven and one new earth. That's it. And that's the end of all arguments. And if someone wants to argue with you about that, you say, listen, I just have to trust in the word of God 
which was written by the Holy Spirit. I believe him, and that's it for me. And if you've got scientific evidence that can prove that there's someone else out there, and, and you know what? Once we're gone up there, all of these things that have come out of America, especially the American military lately, about UFOs. Have you heard it? It was the big thing before um, Omicron. It was the big thing before Ukraine. It was the big thing last year. <gasps> the US military has released all of these information packs about sightings of UFOs. Well, what's that for? When you and I are out of here, we'll be up there getting trained to be the the uh, priests and kings in the millennial kingdom and everyone else will say well we've been taken up by aliens we're in the mothership <laughs> it's amazing what people will believe rather than this do you want to know <sighs> mind you you have to be born again to believe in it but anyway so he, he healed Peter's mother-in-law and in that, in that triumvirate of exercises in the start of Matthew 8, that was three classes of people that were so far below the, the um, uh, attention of the scribes and Pharisees that Jesus really rammed it to them straight after the Sermon on the Mount. You are claiming to be the religious leaders of Israel and you are hypocrites and I'm going to show you what true love and mercy is all about because love and mercy is the center of the Mosaic law. And you wouldn't think so, but it is. There is true righteousness in the law. And the basic righteousness is in the law is God gave it to them in 613 commandments and said, if you want to get to heaven on your own effort, you've got to keep every one of those from the day you were born to the day you die. Can you do it? No. So what do you got to do? You got to rely on him and the cross and Jesus and the shed blood to get up there. That's all. That's all. And someone said to me the other day, um, do you get any correspondence back about you're so black and white about the gospel and you keep going on and on and on about the gospel? Well, some people have got saved by hearing that. There's some people who are now going to heaven that weren't before I keep going on about the gospel. What are you supposed to be as a preacher? You, I, I could give you the most decorated um, presentation that you could ever see. You know, my kid, my son, who, who's going through this tough time because he's on reduced hours, and you'd think that you would feel sorry for him. But this time has done things for you and for me and for my son that would have never have happened if they hadn't have come about. Because do you know what he's done? After I preached for his church a few weeks ago, and we sat down afterwards together on the couch, and we spent three quarters of an hour, he kept asking me question after question after question about the scriptures. A dad with a son going through the Bible. And do you know what? He went home, and he went online, and he started to do the Bible in 24 hours with Chuck Missler on his own. And he said, Dad, he rang me yesterday, and he said, Dad, I'm up to the minor prophets. And, and so, you know, he wouldn't have done that if he had, was working 12 hours a day, six days a week, made, making lots of money. What has he done? He's gone to the Word of God and understands his Father in heaven so much more now than he did 12 months ago. There is... It's the best of times and it's the worst of times. But for me, and seeing people come to faith and come to understand what's really in this word, it's the best of times. And I tell you what, when we're up there, we won't remember the difficulty. We'll say, thank you, God, that you kept me through this all. So this is, the, the, uh, this is a little sort of cameo that Jesus has to do after he heals Peter's um, uh, mother-in-law. And when evening came, and notice this, I'm going to hammer, and I always hammer this, the deeds of darkness in the Bible are so often related to darkness, the evening and the night. 
And where does that come from? That comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Because what was there first? Darkness. Darkness. It was there first. In fact, um, quickly turn to Genesis chapter 1. Oh, this is going to really throw them. It's one of my favourite things. I've got it all written down there. I love Genesis 1. And it says here in, in, uh, in verse 2, And the earth was uh, without form. That's hayah. I believe it's a transitive verb saying it became without form and void. Uh, and there are several verses to back that up, but this is not the argument. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So darkness was there first, and then God said, let there be light. In fact, in Hebrew, he said, light be. It's just a... a, it's just a command word, an imperative word, uh, verb. And so we have lo uh, light coming in after darkness. In Hebrew, darkness is hoshek. It's hoshek. And these are the words that are related in any decent commentary or concordance to the word darkness. Evil, darkness, judgment, misery, sorrow, death and destruction and wickedness. That is associated. You can look up any good concordance and they will tell you those are the words are related to hoshek, to darkness. And then light came along, or. And so many young Jewish babies are called aura. Why? Because they're light. They brought light into the family. And light is related to these words, goodness, righteousness, cheerfulness, happiness, healing, salvation, joy, and life. Remember at the, in the fifth chapter of First Thessalonians, Paul admonishes the Thessalonians that they are the children of the day, the light, not the night, the darkness. And that is the division and only division in humanity. You are either the children of the light, of God, or the children of the darkness, the devil. And John says that in uh, 1 John 3, 8, 9, and 12. It's quite clear. He's, he, you know, he says it so blatantly in that little passage. He said there's only two divisions in humanity, the children of God and the children of the devil. There's no one in between. And we were just talking about that in the car on the way down when um, Ian was saying that he had a, a, um, a, a meal with his parents this week. Can I say this about your, about your mum and dad? Well, they won't be watching it, that's for sure. <laughs> and, and he said they are so hostile, hostile to his faith and the word of God. Do you know what I mean? And he still keeps pushing nudging and that sort of thing and until we're taken out of here he still will do that and I tell you what it's worth you still doing that with your family because Sue and I got my sister saved at the age of 74 and she was so against it for so long she was going to be rich and famous and all the rest of it and she sort of stuttered along in life and that sort of thing and and you know because she's my older sister she was like another mother but the best thing that I ever, ever received in this family was that she accepted Jesus at the age of 74. And that was in part because she came over here, came to this church, and there's some ladies over there that just loved her into the kingdom. It's never give up. Never give up. There's just a contrast between dark and light, and it's the main sub-theme in the Bible. Light and darkness, light and darkness. In, in um, um, this is in Genesis 1 and, uh, 1 and 2 and 3. In Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4, it, in describing the new Jerusalem and the new heavens, it says, there shall be no night there. It's not that there are going to be no nights. I don't think so. We're going to have light all the time. But night in that um, context is contrasting righteousness 
with what happened in Genesis 1, chapter 2. There was darkness on the face of the earth. In the new heavens and the new earth, there's going to be no darkness, no night, no evil, no sin. And I went to Russia the second time with a little old lady here from Perth called Valda, and we were talking about these things um, because she was in our, our church. And I said, Velda, can you ever imagine a time in your life when you will never sin? And she said, no, I can't. I said, just wait till the new heavens and the new earth. And it's beyond our comprehension. It's beyond our comprehension that we will never sin. We will never age one more minute than when we get our resurrection bodies. And we will never, ever be assailed by the devil again. Do you understand? It's just a gift that we don't even appreciate that's coming our way. And so when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And Matthew always reaches back into the Old Testament in his gospel and refers the prophecies of the, in the Old Testament of the Messiah to his gospel. And what he's saying here, this is a quote from Isaiah 53, verse 4. And the whole thing in 53 is about Jesus, about the servant of God, and what he did for us. And so Matthew is just bringing this himself that he took in himself our infirmities and he bore our sicknesses. And I haven't got time because we've got to uh, whip through this, but that's a whole message in itself. I love Isaiah 53. Mind you, mind you it starts three verses before in 52 because God says, Behold my servant. That's where that uh, uh, chapter should start. But it, now, after he's done this, after he's done these healings, Two men come up to him. And this little paragraph, these two in incidents are called the cost of discipleship. And it's, this is you and me. This is you and me. Listen carefully. And when Jesus saw the great multitude, multitudes about him, he gave a, a, a command to depart to the other side. You know, Jesus and his humanity used to tire out. You know, he's done this all day. First, the, he came down from the mountain after the Sermon on the Mount. He healed the leper, sorted out the centurion's problem, fixed uh, Peter's mother-in-law. Now he's healed a, a massive number of people outside Peter's house, and he's just tired. Do you understand that? Jesus in his humanity could get tired. And he was weary, and so he, what he wanted to do was just to clear the decks and spend time with his disciples. And he said he gave a command to depart the other side. And then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. A scribe was one of the elite in Jewish society. He's one of the ones that Jesus has just criticized in the Sermon on the Mount. And yet he's part of that mob that is surrounding Jesus. And he comes up to him and says, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Do you remember some of the silly things you, say, you said that just after you were born again? I do. I was walking around four inches above the ground on the cloud. I was so happy with eyes. And up at the mine, people used to get so angry with me because I used to be Mr. Granny Smith up there. Um, you know, strong personality. You, that would be surprise most of you, but... Um, but when I became a Christian, I so totally changed it annoyed them. But I was just going around with a silly grin on my face all the time. And you think, oh, I'm going to do this for God, and I'm going to do this for God, and I'm going to reach out this for God, and I'm going to do this. Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Have you made silly commitments like that? And all of a sudden, life intervenes. And Jesus said to him, if he's a scribe and he's the elite in Jewish society, what do you think he's got? He's got a lovely home. He's got possessions. He's got um, um, standing in the, in the society. He's got everything he could want. But he's saying to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And this is the cost of discipleship for this man. And Jesus said to him, 
Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So what is he saying? Are you prepared to give up everything for me? And I'll tell you what, in our 30 something years of faith, Sue and I have been put through situations where we have lost everything and had to start again. And you know what? Um, what I learnt in that is he can't use you until he breaks you. The old you is no good anymore. You, the new you is the you that he wants. Do you understand? And we went through trauma and, and upset and, and, uh, and the kids you know, were crying and all the rest of it and we started again and we started again and we started again. And I tell you what, I wouldn't go back and change a thing. Because in all of those situations, I learned something about me and I learned something about him that I would never have learnt if I hadn't been put through those situations. And so he's saying to this scribe, are you willing to give up everything you have to follow me? And another person came up to him in verse 21. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And I don't know if uh, you've been well taught on this, but in uh, ancient Israel, throughout the whole of the Middle East, and it's still true to today, to today and it's still true here in Perth, if someone dies in the Morosef at home, um, the funeral company come within a couple of hours, take them, and they're interred the next day. They're interred over at Karakata in the Jewish section of this Karakata Cemetery, and they're done the next day. They, it's a very simple um, um, ceremony. There's just a plain box. It goes down. All the men folk there, and I've done it several times, You've got to, it, all of us have to take turns to shovel the dirt back over the uh, casket. And then a year later, there is a dedication of the, of the consecration of the headstone. And so what this guy is saying, let me first go and bury my father. He's not saying his father's dead because he'd already be there if that was true. What he's saying is, I'm not willing to commit to you yet, Jesus, but after my father is dead, I'll come and join you. And what does Jesus say? Follow me now and let the dead bury their own dead. You know what that means? Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. That's one of the most profound statements that is in this passage. Because what this guy was saying, he's not doing or trying to impress Jesus to say, I want to honour my father and bury him. What he's saying is that He's not dead yet. I don't know when he's going to die. He looks very healthy. I can't put my finger on it. But after that, I'll come and follow you. I'll come and serve you. And you know what? That was a profound, profound teaching for me very, very early on in the 90s. Because Sue and I were at a lovely home group at the Churchlands Christian Fellowship in Belcatta. And we went to this uh, home group and loved it. And we'd already done some weird things for Jesus um, that were quite well known in the church. And this lovely man who was head of the home group came up to Sue and I after we'd had the study and had a cup of tea and that sort of thing. And he came up to Sue and I and he said this. He said, I'm, I'm approaching retirement and when I retire and I get all of my superannuation and all my entitlements, then I'm going to do things for Jesus like you. It doesn't go that way. It doesn't work that way. What if Jesus asked him to do something for him the next day that would cost him? And he'd say, no, but I planned my life out. And once I'm comfortable where I am, then I'll take the risk and serve Jesus. No, you don't. You just serve Jesus. You take the risk no matter what. And it's just amazing how I learned that so early on and then I had this lovely man saying, when I'm financially secure, 
then I'll go and do something for Jesus. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Now, here's the kicker for this particular message. Now, when he got into the boat, so those two guys came up to Jesus while he's working from Peter's house down to the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And one of the commentators that was looking at this sort of said something that's fairly interesting. I don't think it's profound. But he said, from ancient times till now, when a crew is about to board its ship to go out to sea, the tradition is the captain always gets on first. I don't know if we've got, we got any sailors here or been in the merchant navy or the, the, the actual navy, but this is apparently true for, um, for navies, like, like military navies of, of, uh, of countries, that when you are setting off on a mission, it's the captain of the ship that boards first, and then the crew follow him. And it was just a very interesting comment because he, he saw this particular phrase and he said, now when he got into the boat, then the disciples followed him. And it's like an acknowledgement that you are Lord, you are in control. And boy, is he in control. You just watch. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. And this Matthew is doing a typically Jewish thing. He really finishes it off really quickly. It's just an incident on the water, and he does the minimum to tell us what happened there. But I love the Mark's, uh, Mark version of it. And in verse 38 in Mark, it says, And he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. Right? He's asleep in the stern. This great tempest has come down. And in the Luke version, the disciples are bailing so fast to try and keep the boat up that they're saying, and, and they come to say, Jesus, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you know what I, do you know, I have these little epiphanies when I'm make, make, doing these messages up. And I just pictured Jesus on a pillow in the stern of the boat, sound asleep. And they're panicking. And there's a storm. And do you know what? That beautiful old hymn came straight into my mind and started playing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. <sighs> I could go on. Heir of salvation, <laughs> purchase of God, born of his spirit. Washed in his blood. This is our story. This is our story. This is our song. Praising our Savior all the day long. Anyway, that's what came to me. <laughs> Do you know what? Do you know what? Why it came to me? Jesus had blessed assurance. Because he knew his father was looking after him every second he was on this earth. Do you understand? He knew that he had come to earth to die on a cross for everyone and then to be buried and then to be raised again on the third day. He knew that that was God's will for him and he knew that that would come to pass. And he had that blessed assurance he could sleep through a storm. Are you sleeping through storms or do you lie awake at night worrying? In two and a half weeks, I've got to go and see my hematologist for my next checkup. I don't know what he's going to say. He can either say, you're fine, go away for another six months, or he might say, oh, no, you might need treatment. God's already written that whole thing out. So why would I worry now about what's going to happen in two weeks' time? Putin might have blown us all up by then. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? When, it, when I saw what Mark recorded, that he's asleep on a pillow in a tempest, 
And I thought, we all go through tempests, but do we have that same blessed assurance that Jesus is mine? And, and we have a destiny in heaven that is going to, you can't conceive of it right now in your human minds because it's so glorious that's waiting for us. That's why I think Stu gave us the, the rapture passage at the start of the praise and worship. But this is what the uh, disciples scream out in Mark. Then he arose and he rebuked the wind, but look what he said to the water. Peace be still. And it was. And you know what? When you're getting anxious about anything, Jesus is turning to you from the throne of God at the right hand saying, Peace. My peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Not that the world gives you, but that I give you. And you should go from here until we're out of here with that blessed assurance and the peace of Jesus Christ drenched on you. That's what these passages are for. We're not reading a little narrative about a bunch of um, disciples on the Sea of Galilee um, with Jesus asleep in the boat. That's you and me. We're in tempests right now. There's people who have had to give up their jobs. There are people facing um, health issues and all the rest of it. We're in storms ourselves. And Jesus says, peace be still. And he said to them, the wind, oh, sorry, and the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And, but he said to them, and this is the same thing that he said to those two disciples that came up to him. He said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? I wouldn't want to be in front of Jesus when he's looking at me and said, oh, ye of little faith, I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's always a work in progress, let me tell you that. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be? Even the wind and the sea obey him. And I've taken out the Luke 8 passage, boys. Um, I want to go straight down now. Can you give me the, la the, the map of um, the northern Galilee? That's it. So by the time of Jesus, this sea here on the left-hand side from all the way up round to Bethsaida, was, that was the Jewish side of the sea. On the, on the right-hand side where you've got Hippus and Gamla and all the rest of it, that's the area of the Gadarenes. That's a Gentile area. So Jesus was leaving the Israeli side of the um, lake and he was going to the Gentile side of the lake. And if you can remember in this passage that we're calling out later, Isaiah 61. And this is what happened. In Mark, I'm going to read um, Mark all the way through. I've done the, the, the Mark uh, thing. I want the whole thing of Mark, um, boys, uh, 1 to 20, because it's so much more um, powerful than what uh, Matthew puts in. Matthew just sort of skims over it, but I want to see, show you what Mark said. And then they came to the other side. This is Gentile country, to the country of the Gadarenes. And verse 2, And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And the reason why I am showing you the difference, because in Matthew it says two men met him. But this is the man that Jesus had an effect on. And so Mark zeroes in on this guy for this whole passage here. And he said, And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and neither could anyone tame him. I have been in the presence in my um, work in disability. I've been in the presence of people who have a strength that just 
belies um, rational thinking. And uh, I have only ever been put down twice in my life. One was at high school and we were just acting the goat. Uh, and so that was just a, a, a sort of accident. But a few years ago, this skinny, small little person with arms not much bigger than that, um, he was looking at me and I was looking at him and he sort of reached up and he grabbed my shoulders like that and, it, and I, it, we knew each other quite well. We were, he was a disability client. Um, but he had a real thing for certain ladies, right? He just had a thing for them. It wasn't mean, but he used to um, uh, chase them after and sort of run around the car park with them. And anyway, the supervisor, who was one of these ladies, snuck up behind me, and I didn't know she was there, and she looked over my shoulder and waved at this guy. And the strength that he had in his skinny little arms, he spun me around so quickly that my feet were still standing that way and I was turning that way and I fell like a pine tree onto uh, um, concrete stones. And uh, everyone rushed over and rushed over and rushed over and I, praise God, I was fine. But I was staggered at the strength he had in that tiny little body. And when I read this passage there, I can fully understand it. But this guy can break chains. He can break shackles. That is demonic force that is, that is staggering and, and, and worrying. But Jesus, it doesn't bother Jesus. Peace, be still. But I've been in the, in the um, company of a certain two or three clients where you just know that things like this had affected them. And one uh, was born in Pakistan to Christian missionary parents and in, and in rural Pakistan. And you can imagine the spiritual opposition to that whole situation in a deeply Muslim country. And that guy was actually um, cast off by his parents. Even as a tiny little child, he was demonic, demonically behaved and they couldn't handle him. So they actually brought him back to Australia and put him into an institution and he's been there for the rest of his life. And three men have to take him out for a day, uh, a day trip. Three men have to walk with him because he's so strong and he is so unpredictable. And it takes three big grown men to control him. And so this thing is real. This thing is real. And always, verse 5, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Who knows people who have self-harmed? Yeah. Yeah. You've got to pray for them. Because sometimes there's someone involved, a something involved, you know what I mean? And you need to cast that out in Jesus' name. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran. And this is strange. He worshipped him. What did I say the worship was involved? What did the leper do when he worshipped him? He fell face down on the ground and worshipped him. That's what that word in the Greek means. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, now this is interesting, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Isn't it amazing how the Pharisees and the scribes could miss Jesus as the Messiah, but every demon knows who he is? Have you noticed that in the scriptures? Whenever they see him, they say, what are you going to do to me, O oh, son of God? This is what, and he called, this one called Jesus, son of the most high God. That's El Elyon, that is God the Father. I implore you by God that you do not torment me. And what he's saying is, I don't want you to send me to the abuso before it's my time. And Jesus said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, what is your name? 
There was a protocol in uh, Pharisaic Judaism that if you wanted to exercise a, exorcise a spirit out of a person, you first had to ask the person or the spirit his name, and he was obligated to tell you, and you had to use that name against him. Do you understand? That's what is the third mess messianic miracle involves. And I'm going to tease you with that because it's coming up soon in the book of Matthew. And he says, what is your name? And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, a legion is a uh, uh, section of the Roman army anywhere between three and 6,000. Do you understand? Between three and 6,000. And what do you get out of this little statement just here? that in the spiritual realm, dimensionality is not the same as you and I. How on earth can between three and 6,000 evil spirits inhabit one person? Can you see what I mean? You can't get elbow room. It shows you that the dimensionality involved in the spirit realm is not what you and I are locked into. And he said, and he also begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. Now, who has occasionally over the last couple of decades ever listened to Chuck Missler? Yeah, I love him to bits. I love him to bits. He can be really crazy sometimes, but I just love him to bits because he filled me with the enthusiasm for this book. And he was um, really taken with this particular passage, and he was taken with um, um, Satanology and demonology. Uh, personally, I'm not. I'd rather deal with angelology and salvation. I'll leave the demons to someone else. Um, but at the end of the day... Um, this really fascinated Chuck because he said, why do these particular demons insist on inhabiting a human being or a living animal? Why? And it seems to be that there's a, um, uh, a certain sector of the dark realm that need to indwell living things. You see what I mean? Um, and so Chuck had this idea that there were uh, there was Lucifer, there was the high-ranking angels called the princes, and then there were fallen angels, and there were demons. Now, this is what he teaches. I'm not teaching that, but he was trying to work his way through this. And he suspected possibly that the demons were the um, separated spirits of those who died in the flood. Uh, I wouldn't go there, personally, but it, it, it causes me to think these people always insist on indwelling someone or something. And anyway, the, the demons begged him and said, send us into the swine that we may enter them. And the funny, strange, strange thing is, and no commentator makes a decision on this, and at once Jesus gave them permission. Why? Why? It's fascinating. Then the unclean spirits went out of the man and entered the swine. And there was about 2,000 pigs in this herd. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. And Arnold Fuchtenbaum says, you know, it just shows you that um, uh, a pig was more concerned about being indwelt by a demon than a human being. And he said, and this is the first recorded instance of deviled ham. Um, so, <laughs> a joke from a Jewish person can be quite funny because it doesn't sound funny until you think about it, you know. And, and, uh, but this is, the, yeah. And at once Jesus gave them permission. And so this, this entire herd went down and drowned it. So what happened to the spirits? That's never answered. So those who fed the swine... Fled. I mean, you would have a lot of guys looking after 2,000 pigs because that's an incredibly valuable economic resource. 2,000 pigs. 
uh, wouldn't be any good for me, but um, I know people who like pork. Um, um, then they came to Jesus and saw that the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting... Oh, sorry, I missed verse 14. Sorry, boys, go back to 14. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. And this is absolutely amazing, this part. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one that had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. In the other passage, uh, the other two passages that record this, he came to Jesus first naked. Um, and, you know, my wife works in a, a dementia facility where uh, two of the men just run around naked all day. And it might be funny, but it's terrifying for the ladies. Do you understand? And you, you wonder what... If, you're, if, you're, if dementia brings your um, protections down, what can get in there? Do you know what I mean? And I'm not saying that, that anyone with that is, but it's, it's absolutely fascinating that when she describes some of the behaviours that they exhibit, the agitation, the, the uh, running around, the never able to sit and, and, and stop for a minute, it's just, you just wonder. Um, and the, the fascinating thing is that Arnold Fruchtenbaum also said this, that if you read through the rabbinic ledger, uh, literature from David all the way down to Ezra coming back into the land, um, there's almost no mention of de demonic possession in the rabbinic li uh, literature. But from about 300 years out from the first advent, there's an increasing wave of records of demonic activity. And Fruchtenbaum says Satan knew that Jesus was on his way. And so he started stirring up um, um, the, the uh, people in, in uh, Israel to be opponents of, um, of the Jesus who was going to come. And you know what I mean? I have seen... We've, we, you and I are bathed in uh, a situation at the moment worldwide where it's just insane and it's irrational and nothing makes any sense. And that's one of the signs that tells me that he's coming. You know, he's tidying up his chair and things like that, wiping crumbs off and things like that. He's ready because his father's going to say so soon, son, go get your bride. Because it's the father that decides. Do you understand? Not Jesus. It's the Father that decides. And in verse 16, And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. And this is what they did. Did they glorify God? What did they do? Then they began to plead with him, Jesus, to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Now, the two guys on the other side of the lake said, I'm a scribe and I'll follow you wherever you go. Well, are you going to give up everything for me? And the other guy said, I'm going to follow you, but not until I bury dad. And what does this guy do? He says, I want to be with you. I want to follow you. In the four Gospels, follow me is there 23 times. And are you following him? That's the question I ask whenever I do a message like this. And it says, he begged Jesus that he might be with him. Verse 19, however, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you and he departed and began to proclaim in the Decapolis the ten cities all that Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled I keep hammering with you guys don't ever overlook that word marvel it's worth a word study right through the Bible and I told you that this uh, 
Jesus marveled at the faith of the centurion. Remember last week, he marveled. There's a word, it's the word called thelmazo in the Greek, and it ranges from admiration to great admiration to amazement at a supernatural event. So Jesus wouldn't look at the centurion and marvel at him at a supernatural event. He admired him for his great faith. Do you understand? But here, these guys saying, this was the demonic that has persecuted us for years and years and years. Now he's a witness and a missionary for Jesus. And that's why they marveled. And they are astonished at a supernatural event. And you know that there's that difference in there because it's based on context. And in Revelation 13, when the beast has taken uh, all authority after uh, having his image set up in the, uh, in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem, and it says, and the whole world marveled at him because they were looking at a supernatural event. And we might do that um, uh, shortly because I think the time's coming. What is the time? Oh, no, we've got heaps. And so, and he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. And do you know what? Um, there's not much in this, um, uh, in this particular passage. So many, I, I listen to commentators, I listen to preachers, I listen to teachers that do this, and they just zero in on what are the actual facts and the events that happened. Uh, and so many of them don't actually pull the stuff out and say, what does it mean to you and I? And this is what it means to you and I. You know, for Jesus to say to the water itself, peace be still, why is that amazing? I'll tell you why it's amazing. Because he created the water. Do you understand? He created the wind, the environment that generated that sudden tempest. He was the one that spoke all of creation into being. He's not a little human being trying to fight the elements of nature. No, he created the elements of nature. And so if he died for you and I, and we are washed clean by his blood, and we are now the children of God, and we're now waiting to go up there for seven years minimum, to get trained to be the kings and priests in the millennial kingdom, why on earth would, be, would we be faithless and fearful? Seriously? Why would we be? And Jesus would look at us and say, why are you so fearful? I have written out your life day, 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 day until you come up to see me. And Jesus said in that Sermon on the Mount, who by worrying can add one day to your life? You can't. I don't like going to hematologists. I don't like going to cardiologists, but I do. And I used to be a bit nervous, but when you do and prepare messages like this, you say, either you're a hypocrite, Stuart, or you believe what you're preaching. And I believe what I'm preaching. And the only thing that would ever worry me about this is what happens to the people left behind. Because that's the human part of me. That's the, like Jesus got tired and went to the other side of the lake. He was human in that area. And I would worry about my wife and my kids. And my wife said, you don't have to worry about me. I'm going before you. Uh, <laughs> she said, you can do all the worrying. But I just want to finish off now with something that I really wanted to um, encourage you with. I, I ha have been a little bit um, concerned uh, on our chat, chat site. There's been a lot of negative, fearful, doomy, gloomy stuff. Do you know what I mean? And I know that we're all facing fears and everything. But seriously, if you really had and fixed in your heart who you are, what it cost the Father to get you there, 
and where you are going, I get a bit antsy at the constant doom and gloom. And I tell you what, since Vlad the Bad attacked Ukraine, I can tell you that the clock is speeding up for you and I. And, you know, uh, and my wife said we had our little um, beautiful little granddaughter down the other day and she's 17 months of age and she's so precocious. And uh, uh, at Christmas time, and I know some of you guys did, um, just for a joke, I went into the reject shop and I bought a little box and they've got three plastic candles in the box. I don't know if any of you have done the same thing. Everyone that's come to the home Bible study and has seen them on the coffee table, they've rushed out to the reject shop and, and they've bought them. And they're three plastic candles about this, this round and one's that side, one's that side, one's that side. And um, they're actually remote controlled by a little remote controller for $12. Cost me more to put batteries in them, if you know what I mean. And anyway, you, you, you've got this little remote control, and, and Sue looks at me as if, oh, where did you get that from? And I'm playing with it, and I'm bringing up all these different colours, and you can get them to go different colours and all the rest of it like that. And they're, they're quite mesmerising. You know, you can just sit there on, on the couch and just, oh, oh that's a brilliant colour. And they all change colours and everything like that. And our little daughter, our granddaughter, <laughs> saw the little remote control. It's only, it's only like this, the size of a matchbox. And she looked at it, and it's got all these buttons on it, because you can have different colours and all the rest of it and different patterns. And she looked at it, and she walked around the coffee table, went up to the TV and was going... <laughs> <laughs> 17 months old! And she thought, oh, it's a remote control. Must control that thing. Uh, those are the little things that just give you joy in this life. Do you know what I mean? And so I want you to, to, to think on this thing that I'm going to read out for you. And it comes from Revelation 22. And it's 1 to 7. And he, the angel, showed me, John, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street... On either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the... No, it's not healing. Why would it be healing if you never get sick? The word in Greek is therapeutos, so it's therapeutic, not healing. If you're sick, you need healing. You're in the eternal state. You don't get sick. You don't sin. You don't age. Nothing happens to it. That's the worst translation I have ever seen. It means they're there for your therapeutic well-being. They keep the grin on your face. Why? I don't know. Ask them when we get up there. But it's not healing. That's my little thing. We'll get past that. It's not healing. How can you be healed in the eternal state in the new heavens and the new earth? You're going to have a glorified body. You're going to be in the presence of God the Father and the Lamb, and he can't allow any sin, death, or sickness to be in his presence. Do you understand? That's why we need a glorified body, a resurrection body, to even go into his presence. Because if we had this body going up there, it'd explode. We couldn't contain his holiness and his righteousness. That's why we need a new us going up there. And in verse 3 it says, And there shall be no more curse, praise God, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, they need no light or lamp for the sun, of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Do you know who that is? You lot. You are the only 
section of the redeemed people of God who are called kings and priests. Do you know that? Do you know that? You're going to be ruling and reigning up there forever. And there's a passage further down about the kings of uh, the earth bringing in the glory into this, into this particular uh, event. And that's another teaching. But there shall be no night there. You notice night, darkness, sin, evil, judgment, sickness. It's not there. Isn't that marvellous, Margaret? We're waiting for it. <laughs> There shall be no night there, and they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. And here's the kicker, verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, does he mean Revelation or does he mean the Bible? I say yes to both. Because he's coming back soon and very soon. And we're going to be with him. And I just hope and pray that that understanding of our eternal destiny will give you a different perspective on the insanity that's out there. That is their world. This is our new world. And don't you ever forget it. And don't you ever forget it. You are kings and priests in the kingdom of God. And you look at yourself and you say, us? Yes. Because that teaching that study we're doing at home and on the Zoom, the 33 th things that you are given the moment at your salvation, when Jesus, when, sorry, when Father looks at Jesus, he sees every one of you. Do you understand? Not group think. He sees each and every one of you individually when he looks at Jesus. And when he looks at every one of you individually, he sees Jesus. Do you understand? Because you are in Christ. You are in Jesus Christ. You are in him. You are in whom? You are indissolubly united with Jesus Christ because you've put your faith and trust in what he did for you on that cross 2,000 years ago. And when he, we were both co-crucified with him, we were co-buried with him, we were co-raised with him, and we will be both glorified in the sight of the Father in him. In him only because of him. And don't you ever forget it. And so whatever is happening in, in the Ukraine, I'm praying for them. My professor um, at Chafer Seminary uh, has had a long association with Ukraine. He used to go over and teach there every year. And he sent a couple of emails from people, from Christian friends in the Ukraine. And they said, it's very tough uh, some friends of his got to the Polish border. There's so many cars it takes 18 hours to get through the border. And they said it's bitterly cold and windy. They're sitting in their cars and they, they just can start the engine just for a little while to heat the car up again and then they have to turn it off because they have to wait there 18 hours to get through the border. So you think you're doing it tough? Father, we just come before you right now. And Father, we just, just absorb the brilliance and the magnificence and the majesty of your word, Father. That there was Jesus in a storm and a tempest on the Sea of Galilee, asleep in the stern, on a pillow. Why? Because he knew you were watching over him. And Father, I pray now that everyone would leave here today knowing that you are right now on the throne of grace looking down and watching on every over every one of us father and as we go out from here this week and as we face the things that are going to um, challenge us this week i just uh, 
I just want to instill in everyone here that sense of blessed assurance because that is going to be our heavenly origin, Father, in that passage out of Revelation 22. We're going there, Father. We're going to be in your presence. There will be no night there because the Lord God, you are our light, Father. And as we wait on this earth for your Son to come and get us, Father, may we be salt and light and witnesses for him in the time that we are still here, Father. And every Christian in this room said, Amen. Amen.